Okay, perfect. All right, thank you very much for joining me. I'm Nola Simon. I'm your host of the Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence. And today we have now CEO of Fast Forward, Gavin McMahon. I am pronouncing the last name right, right? Yeah, well, you're pronouncing it in a Canadian American way, but it's fine. <laughs> okay, give me the full UK. I'm not bothered. <laughs> you don't want to give the full UK version? Well, I just I just go by Gavin. And then that, oh, okay. Well, and that's that's the, that's what I actually run into with podcasting is because I know everybody from social media often. It's like I only really think of you by your first name, right? Because yeah. uh, you pop into my feed, and I'm like, oh, okay, it's just Gavin. It's like an old friend, right? So yeah. I find it challenging when I'm actually introducing people on podcasts because it's like I've never pronounced the last names half the time. I I I, I barely remember people's last names. It's, I go by first names, and that's that's pretty much it. It's easier. Oh. Yeah. Well, do you recognize people? I'm very bad at recognizing people from profile pictures too. That's my other thing. I'm just kind. Of, I'm just trying to remove space in my cluttered mind. So <laughs> I'm, I'm like, it's a fifty percent. Fifty percent of it's gone if I don't have to bother with last names. <laughs> so Gavin, I uh, we met online, and I can't even remember how you popped into my feed, but I just remember that you were born in Kes. Well, no, it's it's pronounced Keswick in the UK, right? Near Keswick. So yeah. I, I live, yeah, in the north of England near the Lake District. And in, in the UK, it's called Keswick. And you live in Keswick, right? And I live in Keswick in Canada. And likely the Keswick in Canada was actually a name for the Keswick in the UK. I, would I have no idea. I just yeah. live here. What do I know? <laughs> yeah. And so that had caught my attention because I'd never actually met anybody who'd ever lived there. Yeah. Um, and that's how we kind of started chatting. And then we realized that we really kind of had a lot in common in terms of like change and leadership. And um, then he started writing these amazing newsletters. And if you haven't seen his newsletter, I own the distinction of telling him he got featured in LinkedIn. Yes. So uh, if you note at the bottom of his link, his LinkedIn newsletter now, he's like often featured in LinkedIn. So that would be where I started. Yeah, I he totally owes all of the distinction of writing it. I just, you know, popping in there too. Yeah, yeah. I think we started talking about the future of work and and yeah. remote work and all that kind of stuff, generally speaking. Because the newsletter covers I think it's all connected. It covers leadership, storytelling, and the future of work, which to me is all one big happy subject. Um, but I get told often I should focus more. <laughs> Focus more on leadership or something. Focus more on something. Just focus. Oh, okay. Well, I'm I'm completely with you because those are my Bailey Wicks as well, too. Yeah. Um, and Gavin is the reason that um one of my other guests was here too. So Rose Fast was the original founder of Fast Forward and you you co-founded it together, actually, didn't you? Yeah. A long time. And ago. um, so he had sent me a note going, Hey, Rose has a book. Would you mind talking to her? And I'm like, sure. And we had the most amazing conversation. Yeah. And um that's really what your business is founded on is conversation, right? Yeah, it's, um, I, I mean, we're a small consulting firm and we really work and help big companies, um, I would say, be more effective. Their teams be more effective, their senior teams be more effective. The, yeah, and it's really around, I, it's really around driving some kind of transformation goal. I mean, back when we started, I don't think it was even, you know, there wasn't all this money and spend on on digital transformation, but it, it was it was all going on, and we've we've helped large companies, I think, drive changes in their in their culture, in their organization, in the way their teams work. You know, oftentimes we get Rose likes to say that we're in the McKinsey aftermarket. So, <laughs> a company has spent millions of dollars with McKinsey, and they have a strategy, and they they just can't get anyone doing it. And so, we generally help in that in that space. And a lot of it is through, I mean, the tools in our tool bag are really leadership and storytelling. It's really about getting people to see themselves in the picture, and how do we move move them forward? Um, and it could be, you know, any any type of organization we work with, with all sorts of industries. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what we do. And that's the, the interest and how, how all this is connected. Yeah. And so basically you're operationalizing the strategy. Yeah. We, we, okay. we say translating often because I think that's usually the biggest problem is it's, it's there. It's kind of worked out, but no one's doing it. And the easy default for people is to do, 
you know, if in doubt, do what you did yesterday. Yes. Right? That, that's the kind of default setting that I think most people have. And I think it's fair to assume that most people want to do a, a good job. They they want to be effective and they want to be valued and and vice versa. I think most companies want their employees to do a good job and be valued. But when they don't really know, you know, they've heard the strategy. Someone got up and talked about it on PowerPoint, but they haven't connected the dots all the way down to what does that actually mean for me? Then that's a problem. Someone okay. someone told me the other day, they said, uh, you know, I get criticized a lot because they say I'm too tactical. And I said, well, I think that's a compliment because if you're tactical, you're actually enacting the strategy. So you should turn around and say, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You should be worried if people say you're too transactional because that could mean you're doing anything and it's got nothing to do with what's immediately in front of me or enacting the strategy. But yeah, anyway, I could go down a, a big bunny trail on that one, but that's 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 what we do. Oh, come on, Gavin. I've never met a rabbit hole I don't like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the way, this is my mug from uh, from Cat Bells, which is a, a fell that's just outside of Keswick. Oh. I did not plan that. But... Oh, well, hey, I mean, you know, I appreciate the unintentional honor. <laughs> Mine is a lovely red cup <laughs> yeah. with no significance whatsoever. So Gavin scheduled this at 8 a.m. I have to tell you, I don't do 8 a.m. podcasts for anyone except him. <laughs> I appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, so we wanted to talk about storytelling. So we had had original conversation about what this podcast would be. And um, so Gavin had taken away from it that I was looking for the perfect storyteller story that would convince CEOs and executive leaders that they should embrace hybrid remote. And that's not really what I was after. It was more about how you tell the story and how does it resonate. So I have a perception that when we talk about hybrid remote and what we do, we're not really talking about uh, the work with resonance. So we're not adding in the sense the sense details. So like what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it smells like. Uh -huh. Like my coffee right now, you can smell if you're just listening mm -hmm. and see if you're watching. Yeah. Right. But um, we're we're not really telling it in a way where the stories actually resonate and you can actually see in your mind's eye what the day to day actually looks like. Whereas people who are in the office have an advantage. They tell a story. They talk about, um, you know, walking into a building. You can imagine the building. You can see the elevator. You can hear the shoes tapping on the marble floors. Yeah. Right. And you have a perception of what that looks like, and you can imagine it in your mind's eye. When you're actually talking about like remote work, we're not telling the stories to engage the the imagination. And mm. that's where I think sometimes it falls off, right? But we went down a rabbit hole with that one because Gavin thought I was looking for the perfect story to convince people. And he's like, let's talk about confirmation bias. So do you want to start with that and pick that up? Yeah, and then we should go back to the the perfect story that you or not the non perfect story that you're looking for the resonant. Okay. Story. Um, but uh, I think the when we were texting back and forth, the uh, I basically said I I don't think there is a story that's going to convince everyone anyone because I think most people are firmly in whichever camp they're in. They're either let's all go back to the office or let's not. And the the reason. I was going to use the word excuse, but I'll I'll be nice and say the reason that people are doing that is generally speaking that they they know that there is a connection between the way people work, how people work, and the business results, the financial results of the company. But the only thing that really is very well measured and has been measured pretty well for hundreds and hundreds of years are those financial results. So we know we're having a good quarter. We're having a bad quarter. That's what we know. And if we're having a bad quarter, it's very easy to turn around and say, well, it's because. Because the things that we justify as reasons to come back to the office, we're not as creative. Uh, uh, people are disengaged. I don't think people do, are doing any work. They're all very subjective reasons. And I think most people, you know, one of the things I'm fascinated by in storytelling is really how it influences people and then how people make decisions. 
And I, I think what we do, everyone thinks of themselves as a very rational person, but we're no human being is really rational. What we are really good at doing is rationalizing things. So if we've made a decision, like let's all go back to the office or let's all go remote, everyone's spending a lot of time rationalizing that decision. But that decision is very much an emotional decision. So, and I, you know, I think it's hard to imagine sometimes for people that CEOs really, you know, famous, well-paid executives are emotional in their decision making but i think everyone is everyone's the same and we just make these decisions and then we rationalize them afterwards so i'll give you a couple of examples that are a kind of hybrid remote work and these are not companies i work with just so everyone's clear that i'm not i'm not telling any inside inside uh, baseball stories but facebook famously when when the pandemic was on and you you read about what they were doing. They were they were looking to get people back, and then eventually they made a decision that actually this remote work thing works really well. But the reason that if you read between the lines and some of the stories, Mark Zuckerberg was on his campus in Hawaii, and and another senior executive was somewhere else, and they all basically liked being remote and working from wherever they wanted to work, and and doing that, and they were you know, that that made that decision. I know another CEO who um, they have a company in New Jersey, didn't really love being in New Jersey, sit down in Miami, wants to work down there, and the company is remote. Now, th there's, so there's all sorts of reasons these decisions get made. I mean, if you're in the technology industry and you're competing for talent, and again, that comes in cycles, boom and bust cycles, you if everyone else is offering flexibility and you're not, then you can't compete for that talent. So I know, I think everyone knows all the reasons, but I think at the heart of it is, is ego. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about that. And it's, it's something I follow Scott Galloway. I think he's, he's mm. an amazing communicator and really sharp, uh, very provocative sometimes. But a few years ago when Amazon was talking about, where are we going to put our headquarters number two? And there's all these cities in the US. Oh, right. Yeah. Competing for the privilege of getting yeah. Amazon headquarters. I think they were down to the final 10. They'd done their first cut. And Scott Galloway was on a TV show and, and he was asked by the presenter, who, which city do you think is going to win? And he said, well, I think it's down to New York or Washington. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be Washington. Now, he made that call. Uh, I think four or five months before the actual decision came out. There's no way he could know, but he was dead on. I mean, it was Washington. And then the presenter asked him, well, why do you think that? He said, it was really easy. Uh, Jeff Bezos owns the company. He is just bought a huge brownstone in Washington, D.C. that he's renovating and he's, it's going to be a really nice house. He's got the Washington Post, which is a little toy that he's got. And if I owned the company, I wouldn't want to commute very far. And so it's going to be Washington, D.C. So that's that to me is an example of a very ego based decision. I'm sure it was very rationalized, but right. all decisions are made that way. And that's where I think storytelling comes in, because storytelling can't necessarily change a decision, but it can influence the decision. So you, that's where you get there. So I don't know if that's really talking about confirmation bias. I think the confirmation bias is I've already made the decision. So I'm just looking for reasons and stories to explain. Right. I'm going to find similar examples that kind of shore up the decision that I've already made. And these are, they're not precedents, but they're, they're similar decisions that I can cite that I'm in the norm, basically. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's interesting because now Jeff Bezos is like taking apart the Washington Post. Yeah. And getting it. So uh, uh, in terms of timeliness, that's a perfect story for today. So yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I think that that is very correct. And, and there was actually another story I shared this week as well, too. Did you hear about the UK company? I think it's like a home building company. Mm. I can't remember the name of it. But anyways, um, they brought in, in, in the pandemic, they had a CEO who committed to remote. Right. right. Completely. You could work from anywhere. You could move. You could do anything. It was 100% remote. And then he left. 
they yeah. brought in uh, a woman and she just announced a whole return to work initiative. It's three days a week, so they still have flexibility, but um, it's going to come into effect in April. And she wrote a, a whole post I went back and found on, on International Women's Day. And the reason that she felt that she needed to have people in the office is because that's how she was successful after her maternity leave because yeah. she was there in person. She got mentorship in person and she feels because of the demographic of her employee base being 60% female, that they should be in the office because it's going to give them the types of opportunities that she had and she attributes her success, success to. Yeah, and It was sort of interesting because it's one of the first times that I've actually seen a story like that told probably because there's so few female CEOs from that visibility aspect from the female perspective. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, it's, there is no, I mean, let's, let's say from the beginning, there is no one size fits all solution. So some people will love going into the office. Some people will not. Yeah. Um, some, and I think generally speaking, if you like going into the office, you get your, cues your orientation your uh how you organize yourself at work you get that really from other people you're very externally facing if you really generally like staying at remote and working from home you are someone that is pretty organized on your own generally speaking or you've just got a horrible commute and you just don't don't want to do it it's one of those two things uh I think a lot of the stories that come out and there are a lot of the reasons and the rationale for decision making is very much based on people's personal experience. Yeah. And we used to have a one size fits all solution. We used to have a everyone in the office pre pandemic. I mean, pretty much now, now that the toothpaste is out of the tube, so to speak, it's very difficult for companies. It's, it's easy for a company of our size to, to be flexible because we're very small and when you are small, it, it, the, it's not difficult to institute things that make uh, teams work. When you're doing it at scale and you've got 50,000 people in an organization, you're really relying on individual leaders. And previously we had all our, all our kind of leadership experience is based on the the framing and the physical environment of an office if you think about it so and and things that you get advice about as you as you learn to to manage teams or you you know you get promoted you know, you've got to walk the floor you've got to my door is always open you've got to be good on your feet all those things are very very based in a physical office all this advice so when you talk about stories and there aren't any resonant stories for um working from home that's true and it'll take a lifetime to develop those things because we've already had a lifetime to develop the corridors of power you got to be good on your feet my door is always open type of stories about how do you lead people so i i think it's going to take a, a while and i think the you, you know the big onus is really on individuals i, I think everyone has a a responsibility let me put it this way i think whichever door you choose as a as a as a company you have pluses and minuses if you choose let's everyone go back to the office and especially if you've already been wishy-washy about all these things you're basically choosing to effectively pay more for your people because mm -hmm. you you'll you'll recruit from a smaller pool and you'll have to transactionally give them more money give them more something else to compensate for the benefit that you would get in flexibility that's okay that's just a choice um and then on the other side the people that choose to do that are choosing to work for that kind of organization and that kind of company so the the other door is we're all remote that's also pretty easy because those two those two extremes are very monolithic right if you, if everyone's remote, then how do we how do we work remotely? You, you you develop routines. You you make sure you invest in technology. You recruit the kind of people that are very good at working remotely and, and are quite happy in doing that. 
And so that that works. It's the middle door that is the problem for most companies. And most big companies have chosen that door because they've got distributed teams. So I could have a team that's mostly around New York or mostly around Boston, or I could equally in that same company have a team that's spread all over the US, or I could have a team that's spread around the world. How do you deal with that? And, and that comes down to, you can't deal with it through policy. You have to get, I think it comes down to the leader and the individual, and there's two responsibilities. The leader's job has changed, but not changed. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the individual, individually, you have a job that is beyond your current job. And I think most people don't realize that. When you went to the office and we had that one size fits all solution of an office, you signaled all the time. You didn't realize it, but if you came in late and you left early, you signaled that I don't really want to be here and I'm not looking for my next promotion. If you came in early and you left late, you signaled, I really want to be here and I'm looking for my next promotion. If you were always getting up and getting a coffee, you you signaled that you were available or, or being social about or you know working with people. If you're always in a conference room or if you're in a conference room, you're signaling that you're busy. These signals, we didn't have to work out at all. We just were there. I'm sat at my desk. I look like I'm absorbed in an Excel spreadsheet. I look like I'm really busy. I'm just signaling to everyone around that looks in my direction that I'm really busy. People who know you well know you're on YouTube, but yeah. Right. <laughs> when, and when we're on, when, but when we're at, at home, that signal is completely lost. There's right. no manager can see that. So I think there's a responsibility that we have as individuals that are working remotely to signal just for everyone else's orientation, what we're doing, what we're working on, when we're working, and just be more transparent about that because it will actually help us in the end. It'll help us learn from other people. It'll help teams work better. It'll help managers manage work better and help leaders lead better. On the other it's, hand, it's that balance of trust so what is it that people need to know to be able to trust that you are doing what you're supposed to do right and how do you do that without actually evolving into surveillance right and if you don't want that surveillance then start so you know put your put put the work that you're doing on your calendar even if the work is focus time i'm working on writing this report to our block now, normally, you, most people wouldn't put that on their calendar because they just know they're going to work on it and they're, and they're doing it. But it's actually a very useful signal. So time boxing your work and signaling what you're doing through a calendar is a, is a really useful and practical thing. On the, uh, I'll, I'll shift to the uh, other side of things. If you lead, lead teams and you're leading organizations, you, you really, your work is three things. I, I need to align people because I want them all lined up and roughly in the right direction, because that's strategically where we said we were going and what we said we were going to do. So I have to work at that. And, and again, in the old days, I just used to do that once a year, said, you know, we have the kickoff in January. We told them what our strategy was. We're, we're done now. That's it. We're not doing any more. And then we just relied on the fact that everyone's rubbing shoulders in the office and, and they kind of generally go in the right direction. So alignment. Number two, engagement i want people to be actually engaged in in the work because i they they can be then at their most productive and fulfilled and then number three is productivity i want people to be productive at work now that actually is a two-way street everyone likes to be no one likes to be misaligned and say and given a job that five other people are doing and why did you give me that no one wants to be engaged so they have to watch the, they're watching the clock and just can't wait to get out of there and no one wants to be feel like they're just not productive but how you do that in remote work is the the things that you're doing are the same but how you do it is different the way we used to do it in an office was you know kick off at the beginning of the year here's the powerpoint presentation this is our strategy these are objectives this is what we're doing uh we used to engagement by having you know birthday parties or pizza occasionally whatever you used to do in your in your office 
and we used to manage productivity just on a daily basis. The, the job of the leader, I think, is that much harder now because you have to think about ways to do that. And it requires, um, you know, a different set of skills that leaders have to develop and will develop over time. This has got nothing to do with storytelling. But anyway, I went down. Well, I, I do think that storytelling factors into engagement, though, right? I think it factors into all three. Yeah. I mean, you alignment is all about see, getting people to see. People need to see themselves in the picture. Right. What's and, in it for me? Yeah, what's in it for me? But what, what? How? How do I contribute? Where are we going? How? How do I help us make money? Am I doing the right thing? What's the feedback around this? It's all. They're all stories that you have to tell, and you have to keep telling them. Or you can't just do it once in January, and then wait for next January, or right. the performance review that you've got coming up. Well, and, and people relate to the stories in different ways too. So you have to tell multiple stories because, um, you know, everybody's got a different frame of reference. They've got different mindsets, different worldviews, different values. So which values are they aligned with, right? Like I, my corporation used to have like, what, six different values and some of them didn't really align with the work that I did, right? I mean- well, That's when we talk about translating. Yes. Translating strategy. If you, so we've been doing a lot of work recently where it's, it's setting up the kind of vision, mission goals of the organization or the, or the group, and then translating that strategy down through the organization, because what you really want, and, and you have to tell stories around that. And it, and you really want to do that in a way that people can see what they're doing and that, and they can, shift from what they did yesterday to what they want to do today and mm -hmm. it's funny a lot of people talk about leadership as or they'll if you ask people what leadership is they'll use the word inspire and and if you look up the word inspire in the dictionary it's to want to do something so the, the whole question is how do i get people to want to do it not to tell people to do it but to want to do it and that's what leadership is all about and that requires storytelling yeah, and that's how that's how you tap into intrinsic motivation. They have to interpret the work within the context of their own stories. Mm -hmm. The story that they tell themselves is the most important story. Yeah, well, I, I was so you know this. I'm working on a book. I was looking up and researching around this this self reference effect. Um, there's a neuroscientist called Frederica. Fabricius, I think I'm pronouncing her name right. The, uh, I have a feeling you butchered it. <laughs> that's another one, another one where we, you know, okay, so I remember, I remember both names in that case. But anyway, she she talks a lot about um, the narrative network in our heads, which is, it's this self-reference effect. It's the idea that when our brains are kind of on idle, when we're daydreaming, when we're basically most of the time, what we're doing is we're thinking about things in relation in relation to us, whether that's perceptually in space, like this is my my mug that I have in front of me, or you know my relationship to you, or my relationship to this thing that we're going to do, or or my regret about this thing in the past, or my horror about this thing that we're going to do in the future. It's all about me, right? right? So we have the self-reference effect and the narrative network is just pl automatically plugging us into the middle of the movie. And when we get really worried and when we don't, we think change is going to be bad, it's when we can't somehow see ourselves in that movie. We somehow don't have a role or we have a lesser, we're less than in that future. And so that's that's where we have to get to in the storytelling. Yeah, exactly. And and it's like what you were saying before, too, like when that CEO is talking about the fact that people who work from home just basically sit on the couch and do housework and chores and watch TV, he's really saying that's what he that's would, what do I would do if he worked from home. Yeah, and exactly. therefore, because I think that I would behave like that, that means I have to prevent you from behaving like me at my worst. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's, a, there's also a level of I mean, in, in corporate society, there's a level of respect for the hierarchy that I don't think people realize is there that is that is ego feeding. And you just don't get that at home. 
Oh yeah, very much so. And it's also like the the status as well too. So like you go to the office, you put on the watch, you put right. on the earrings, you've got your branded you know glasses, and you know you walk in and you've got presents because you dressed for that. And yeah. there's an energy that comes from being recognized and witnessed. Yep. That doesn't happen at home. I mean, you know, uh, yes, I did put on earrings for you, Kevin. I have makeup on at 8 a.m. Like, you should be impressed. But that's like bare minimum, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think about how that actually feels different in the office. That's a big thing. One of my first podcasts actually was with a personal stylist, uh, Renee Lindo. And yep. it was because I wanted to talk about the shift in clothing, because I really do think that there's a big shift in in our, our public persona and, and what we value and how we signal um, professionalism. Well, there is. I mean, if you think, I, I mean, I haven't, I don't buy much, but the, uh, uh, there's a whole, it's certainly in men's clothing and men's, so people are wearing, I, I can't speak to women's clothing, but <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's all these suits, but the suits that you get now are, you can still buy suits, but they're all flexible. They're, they're, they're advertised as, you know, you could do backflips in these suits because they're so flexible. They're, it's like wearing sweatpants. It's uh, the investment in soft pants. Nobody wants to go back to the office because nobody wants hard pants. Right. And that, that came from two years of sitting around in sweatpants. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 really fascinating, man. This yeah. whole story there. Yeah. And it's funny because when I, when I talked to Rose, she actually spent a lot of time talking about my hair because she's like, especially with the color that your hair is, it's very rare that people actually wear it long. And of course she has beautiful long hair too. Right. Um, but uh, it's not the same color. <laughs> yeah. So it's that, that type of signaling that happens too. And it, it, it's, it's interesting, the emotions that go into that. And that's partly what I think you're getting at is like there's an ego about going into the office that is lost right because like you know nobody sees your big fancy car nobody sees your big private you know parking space that's right beside the elevator nobody's uh -huh. impressed by the little tiny things that used to actually indicate hierarchy yeah yeah exactly and and then on the other side you hear the argument that says if you're young people young, young people need to go to the office because they need that social space or they yes. they they need to be able and and I think there's a certain amount of truth to that I think I I don't really buy the whole thing about um apprenticeship this is the way we teach people I I buy it from the point of view that yes that is and that's the way you did it your your kind of view of I hire a graduate and that graduate just sits there does whatever i ask them to do and if i and hopefully they learn by absorption about whatever else is going on but what it really was was a lazy way of me teaching right yeah and that argument is like i don't want to invest in changing the way that we've always done things yeah. um and therefore that's why we're not going to do it because it's not worth the investment that's the message that i get from that kind of story that's told yeah um now i will tell you that my kids and i mean your kids are, are older as well too right so you've you've had like yeah. a witness into the job market for for that age group as well too like my kids actually do want to be in person in part because they didn't have a great experience working remotely at school on Zoom, right? Like they were in their bedrooms for three years of like three formative years, basically. And they didn't really enjoy it. Yeah. Right. So the ex I think it comes back to your frame of reference to what it is to work remotely and how do you reframe that? So the other issue that goes in with people have to be in the office to be able to learn when you're first starting out is, well, who are they learning from? Mm -hmm. That means that the people who are like experienced also have to be in the office to be able to teach the younger people. But again, is that part of their job? Are they compensated for that? And what's in it for them to teach the younger people? And right. I think that that's something that doesn't often get translated well it's yeah being something that has always happened that way but now it's like if this means that i have to commute 
it, it used to be, it was, okay, I'm already here. I may as well do it. It's, it's going to help everybody. It's going to help the company. I don't mind doing it. It's just a little bit extra, but now it's an investment to show up and actually do that extra type of training. I think, um, I think really, really good leaders are, are great teachers and they, and they invest a lot of time in teaching people how, how to, whatever it is. And they, and they're able to do it in a way that is, um, engaging and non-threatening. And, and I think they do, you know, I see CEOs that I know a few that are, that, Yes, they're, you know, they're getting ready for the board meeting or they're doing whatever it is. But a lot of what they're doing is teaching people and talking about this is how I view this thing. This is how I would think through this thing. And I think really good leaders are teachers. And I think managers, people that just manage people, which I think is generally a bad thing to do. Rose, I don't know if Rose talked about that when you spoke to her, but managers that manage people don't generally teach people they 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 outsource that problem to l and d and l and d yes. course and you go and do that course and it has may if you're lucky it has some relationship to what you what you do back at the ranch but i think i think again i think companies that are going to win in this new hybrid world or world of distributed work uh, they're really going to be companies that encourage learning and encourage leaders to teach people. Yeah. Like, and, and it's also going to be like, are they learning themselves? Because it's not like everything isn't changing with the advent yeah. of AI, right? So they themselves have to learn and adapt uh, to, to the new world as work too. And so if they're not, if they don't have that flexible mindset for themselves, how is it that they're going to pave the way and clear the friction that's going to allow their people to be able to do it as well. Yeah. It's funny. I was having, so speaking, I've been one of the the last few articles in the newsletter forward thinking have, have been about AI. And yes. I was the one that I'm meant to be working on, but I haven't finished yet is, is about the skills that we need in the future of AI. And so I'm making an assumption that, and it may not be true, but let's make an assumption that AI, chat GPT, Claude, those kind of things, Genesis, become an assistant, a virtual assistant to, to a person. Mm -hmm. How The question is, how good is that? It's and, it, and I liken it to PowerPoint or Excel. You could, you could turn around and give everyone PowerPoint and Excel, but how good are you at using it? And I think the knee-jerk response is to say, well... We need to give everyone classes or training on prompt engineering again, outsourcing the the curiosity gene and the learning and the teaching to L and D. L and D comes down from the mountain and says, "Here's your prompt engineering class. Go on LinkedIn and sign up for this, whatever it is." I don't know that that's going to really help people. I think the skills that we're going to let's assume again we're kind of a few years into the future. AI is an integral part of work in the way e email is. Who's going to stand out in that world? I think people that are critical thinkers and strategic thinkers, that's the first thing. Because if you can't ask the right questions and if you can't think and apply context around what you're you've, – you've now got a really smart assistant that can generate a lot of stuff and, and do it really quickly – well, you've got to do two things. You've got to say, well, is that the right stuff that you're generating? And is it useful or is it kind of motherhood and apple pie? So you've got it. So critical thinking and strategic thinking, skill number one. Skill number two is actually experience. Because the other thing that AI will do and will still do for a long time, I think, is hallucinate. So when it gives you this, yes, you've gone beyond this motherhood and apple pie answer. Now you've got a really good answer, but it's clearly wrong right you need to be experienced enough to know well yeah these 10 things you gave me number seven and number eight are just no that's not right I we're know. not not doing that so so critical thinking strategic thinking experience then communication because i'm still whatever it is that now my super smart assistant is doing 
I've got to communicate that out to a whole bunch of other people. So how do I simplify? How do I communicate? How do I tell stories around this to, to actually communicate and influence decisions in the organization? Got to be able to do that. The, the whole prompt engineering is really just how do I actually use the tool itself? How do I get better at doing that? So there's a whole set of skills that I think people have got away with not, you, you can get away in a pre-AI world with not being that great a critical thinker or strategic thinker because you can make up for it in lots of other ways. Yeah. You, you can make up for all sorts of other, other things. Uh, leadership as a skill if you're again in an ai world you're still going to need to lead people so i think all these skills are people are going to individually people are going to have to double down and say how do i personally get better and i think organizations are going to have to look at the talent pool they've got and say how do we how do we upgrade our talent to be able to get them there help them yeah. get there i th i think that linear thinking was completely reasonable before the pandemic and before AI. And mm -hmm. I think what's needed now is how do you how do you see the possibilities and the connecting dots? Mm -hmm. Right? Like that strategic thinking. Um, it's more like a lattice than a linear line, right? Yeah, I think that's that systemic thinking, the the yeah. kind of connecting the dots. It's all part, you know, file that all under critical thinking and strategic thinking. It's because AI will fill in all those dots for you and it'll do it really quickly. And then picking out the pieces that are going to work for you, that's that's what you need to be able to do. It's What's gonna the be... best AI hallucination that you've seen about yourself? Uh, best meaning the funniest. <laughs> I, I, I can't really... I mean, I tend to ignore that kind of stuff, so I can't really remember a good... I mean, I, I have... I did some research for something... Oh, I can remember what it was. I was looking up something and I said, hey, I'm pretty sure it was Chip and Dan Heath have written this book, Made to Stick. And I'm pretty sure there's yeah. a book about something. And it was, I really should have just Googled it. Um, but I asked AI what was the quote. And then, and then it just didn't sound right. And I said, I don't think that's right. And then it said, oh, you're right. It's not right. And then I actually, then I Googled it. And I saw it in a reference, but it was a is a weird source, whatever the quote was. I can't remember what the quote was. And and then I thought, mm, I'm still not sure. And now I was really unsure about the, what I was remembering, what the quote was, what AI was saying. I was very confused. So I ended up buying the book again. And because I already have a paper copy of the book and I couldn't be bothered to go through that. So I bought a Kindle copy of Made Stick, then, then did a control F to find, I can't, the, find right. the found it then i went back to ai and i told it and said this is the exact quote that is in this that i was looking for and it's on this page and, oh yes you're right i remember now that was the i rem that was my kind of experience of hallucination but it it does do it quite a lot and you just have to be really you know whatever you do you just have to check and double check and that's where the experience comes in you yeah. can't so my my favorite go to is tell me about Nola Simon. So um, somebody told me about perplexity AI. So I I yeah. tested it out, um, and it was actually really really good. And then it got to this middle section, and it's like I am, you are talking to like the global leadership expert at Whale Cornell Medicine. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure they don't hire Canadians. Yeah, Could yeah. be wrong. I'm pretty sure I don't get to work for Poem. Could be wrong, but I'm an author at TEDx and um, like I've written for major magazines. And it's like, this actually keeps it coming up in the variety of actual AI that that has hallucinations about me. And I'm like, apparently I really need to write a book, do a TED talk and actually start writing for all these magazines because AI thinks that's logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, is this what I put on my bucket list? Because this is where... AI can see me reasonably being. Yeah, I think it's, 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 I don't think AI is a good writer. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good synthesizer of a lot of information. Like if you have a, you know how sometimes you get reports and spreadsheets, you, you get a spreadsheet, you get somehow somebody's put everything in a spreadsheet and it's too long to read. Yeah. I don't want to read that. Right. That AI is perfect for that. It's, you know, throw the spreadsheet in and say, what, well, Tell me the top three things I should pay attention to. Right. It can contain it. It's, it's really good at those kind of things. And it can make you, I mean, we're doing things 
you know, we we do obviously training, coaching, build leadership programs. I, I, I mean, there are some parts of what we do that would have taken us weeks and weeks. We can do in a day with with AI. Yeah, there's other parts that I think we wouldn't have even tried uh, that we can use AI for now. Right. Yeah, if you're developing a program or whatever, you can actually kind of run it through and just say, hey, like what aspects would actually enhance this? Yeah. Um, what am I missing? Right. And it gives you that perspective to consider what is logical that you may not have even thought of including. Asking you um, to critique things is a good, good. What? Just say critique this. Yes. And then it, it'll do that pretty well. Although I have run my podcaster, the, the first time I actually used AI for my podcast was uh, when I interviewed that VJ that I mentioned before yeah. and I ran it through it. It was, it was a podcast episode that I thought was, it was emotional. It was interesting. It, it resonated. I felt really good after it. They really liked it. And I ran it through AI and they're like, this is really circular. And you talked a lot about the same stuff all the time. And I'm like, well, I yeah, don't yeah. like you. <laughs> exactly. Because it felt good and I got really positive feedback. So it was funny. So how you ask the question. You say critique this, but be nice. It'll be nice. Oh, yeah. Well, this is before I know you I knew you had to actually tell AI to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's funny. Um, <clears throat> so what's your favorite story that has uh, worked over the years? Um, like, do you have a go-to story that you really find resonates? I I have a few. I think, and I think most people, if they haven't found their kind of signature stories that that help explain things, they they should find them. So the so a long time ago, I was in the uh, the British Army. Um, I was in the Territorial Army, which is the equivalent of. Uh, the National Guard in the U.S. I don't know what the equivalent would be in in Canada, and so I was. Oh, yeah. a, so I went to uh, Sandhurst, which is again for an American audience is the equivalent of West Point, okay. where they basically teach you how to lead, and they do that by they give you a big book, which is a platoon officer's uh, or, or platoon commander's handbook, I think it's called, and then they will basically you you kind of you work as an infantry platoon and you have different roles as you're going through the the course and so sometimes you've got the role of um just a regular squaddy sometimes you're a uh, corporal series section commander in charge of eight eight men sometimes you're the platoon sergeant sometimes you're the platoon commander and you're always basically you know shooting at things so you're attacking a trench you're running up a hill whatever it is you're doing and 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 a lot of it's around the translation of orders so at the end of the day if you're an infantry in the infantry you're you're kind of you're at the at the very end of some general back somewhere which has a set of orders that's going to do this thing whatever this thing is anyway the platoon commander's handbook which is quite a thick book tells you how you translate orders in it and it talks about things like um you know what's the disposition of your troops what's the supply line like what's the weather like what's the ground like what's the cover and terrain like what's the disposition of the enemy troops what what's their supply like there's a ton of things to consider and you get these orders and eventually the rubber hits the road and you you're attacking some trench um and so the, as a, I was playing the role of section commander in this one exercise we were doing, and there was a the way the way they the British Army worked then. I don't. I think it's still the same. Is we had a, a very large color sergeant who was standing over me saying, "What are you going to do now, sir?" And um, I was thinking through this whole manual of list of instructions, what the orders were. So that's the kind of strategy of what we were meant to do. And basically, there's this trench in front of me, and there's I don't know, six or seven guys behind me and and I'm going, uh, I have no clue. And um yeah, I didn't fail, of course, but it was a I was pretty close. Anyway, to cut this long story short, I graduated, be, I became a, a platoon commander, 
back in my regiment. And then I had a corporal in my regiment, in my platoon called Corporal Gray. And I asked him one day, how do you make that decision? The decision that I kind of basically pancaked on, how do you decide what you're going to do when you know in the heat of the moment, things are going down, you you know you've got to attack this trench, you've got all this information, you've got to process and figure out and what what do you do? And he said, That's that's easy, sir. You you've only got three options. You can go left, you can go right, or you can go straight ahead. Mm-hmm. That's it. And I and I went away from that thinking, I have I have this genius in, in the ranks. And then I it took me a while because then I came back a couple of days later and I said, Well, okay, but how do you choose between left, right, and straight ahead? And Corporal Gray turned around to me and said, Well, that's easy, sir. I always go left. <laughs> Which I you know, luckily we were all peacetime soldiers, so nothing bad ever happened to me, nothing bad ever ha- happened to him. But I, I find that fascinating because that, I think, is that's the way strategy works. You have a CEO, yeah. equivalent of a general, says, we're going to do this. We're going to go in this direction. We're going to take that hill. We're going to dominate this market, whatever it is they say they're going to do. And then the strategy cascades down through a set of orders that get translated and translated. And then someone somewhere is going to say, that's too complicated. I'm just going to go left or the equivalent in is that's too complicated. I'm just going to do what I did yesterday and see if anyone shouts at me. That's basically the way organizations work and the and why strategies and change fails. And that I think is why, you know, storytelling and paying attention to getting people to see themselves in the picture, getting people to want to do something is so important. Yeah. So the story that, this all brings to mind to me is the, uh, the the pilot who landed the plane in the Hudson. He yeah. had, what, three minutes to make yeah. the decision about where he landed that plane. Yeah. And everything that he had learned in his entire career synthesized into that sole decision to actually land on the Hudson. Yeah. And it's a fascinating story of how you, what you pay attention to and what you just ignore. And the majority of what you're ignoring is is everything else that's irrelevant, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Sully, my right. dog is named Sully. So I've learned an awful lot about the pilot who landed the plane in the Hudson because my dog is actually named after the big blue monster in Monsters, Inc. But right. it's a demographic question because older people who love Tom Hanks are like, oh, did you name him after the captain? And I'm like, who the heck is this? So I had to learn yeah. about the captain because of my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it is about that. It's about... And I think people get senior leaders get um, they 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 sometimes don't understand why people don't do th- things, and it's not because they don't want to; it's because somehow it's been made too confusing or too dense, and so we don't we don't get there. Yeah, so exactly that's right. But honestly, it's it's really it's the individual who makes that decision in the moment that really counts. Mm. Right. And most of us don't have life or death, uh, you know, decisions to make when we're actually doing the type of work, knowledge work that we do. Right. But, you know, it is inspirational to learn from the people who do have life and death decisions to make and how they make those, because most of the time they're not meeting by committee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So do you want to tell us more about this book and what you hope have hopes and dreams for it to do? Yeah, I'm working on a book. It's a very slow process. It's it's about storytelling. Uh, the working title is Story Business. The whole idea is, I, I think, it, everyone has good ideas, but it's never the best idea that wins. It's the best packaged idea. So how do you actually, how do you actually kind of influence decision making in an organization? And it's about product, product stories. It's about brand stories. It's about um sales stories how do you how do you tell stories that actually influence decisions in organizations yeah that's good and a lot of times it's the human stories that that win yeah coming soon i.e 2027 probably (laughs) you gotta start doing podcast interviews yeah um okay so gavin we'll we'll put uh what your website your linkedin link to the newsletter anything else you want me to put in the show notes uh then yeah, the newsletter LinkedIn. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, not a problem. Well, thank you for sharing your stories with us. I'm going to go get more coffee. Yeah. <laughs>
Sorry I made it so early for you. Oh, that's perfectly fine. It's not like I didn't used to work it. I just, I'm out of the habit. Yeah, exactly. Again, there's only a few people I would do it for. So you're one of them. I appreciate it. (laughs) All right, hang on a second. I'll just hit stop. Figure out where they put stop these days. Oh, stop 